Hi, my name is Shelley, and I serve on the media team at the Yakima campus, and this is why I serve. I've developed a lot of wonderful friendships over the years, and some of them are lifelong friends, and, and that's been really special to me because, you know, we, this is a big church, and there are a lot of people, and it's kind of hard to make those friendships on Sunday mornings, but when you serve on a team, you get to know people, and you just get to form those relationships that you probably wouldn't be able to do if you're just passing by on a Sunday morning. So serving on a Sunday morning really is a joy for me because we all have the same focus and that focus is to see people find and follow Jesus and I, I love being part of that. I love being able to do the video switching because what that does is it it helps me to try to eliminate any distractions so that people can have uh, that are watching at home have an opportunity to join along with us here at church and we want them to feel like they are right here with us on Sunday mornings and that they are being able to participate in the services. So that just really brings me a lot of joy. One of the things I love about uh, the media team is we're very multi-generational. So you, you might be working with young people that are 17 or you might be working with older people like me on a Sunday morning. So we're all serving alongside each other and it's really exciting to me to see how each one of them grow in their uh, abilities and their talents and, and really want to take on even more opportunities to serve as we go along. And, and to me that's just exciting to see others have a passion for media like I do and to really grow in Christ in that way. I would definitely recommend serving on a team here and the media team is a great place if you're looking, if you're kind of techy or you're looking for something along that lines. Uh, we would love to have you and it's a great opportunity for people to grow and to build their faith and to learn more about helping people find and follow Jesus. And so I would definitely, definitely recommend getting involved and plugged in and serving on a team. Well, good morning, Stone Church. It is so good to be here with you today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Pastor Trent. I'm one of the youth pastors here at Stone. Uh, and it is always an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Um, but man, I'm so expectant for what God has in store. And just to kind of give you a little something when it comes to our youth ministry, over the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about our winter camp, which is coming up. Um, but we just this week completely sold out our winter camp, which is super exciting. Definitely something to be celebrating. Um, and so we have a lot of students. There's gonna be over like 150 to 160 of us up at camp, um, which is gonna be super amazing. But I would just love if us as a church, if you guys would just join with us in prayer for our camp, um, just believing for the Holy Spirit to just be moving and active for real memories to be made for these students, but most importantly, real tangible encounters with Jesus. And so we're so expectant. We're so excited. Um, but yeah, today I get the privilege of being here with you. And uh, we are continuing in our series called Heart of the Church, um, which is a study through First and Second Timothy. Um, and so today you guys get the privilege. Uh, we are going to be going through two chapters. So buckle up. There is a lot of information that we are going to be going through. Um, but before we dive into that, I'd love to just take a moment to pray pray over our time together, just to ask the Holy Spirit to meet us today. Obviously, he's already here, but we just wanna pray that he would move within our hearts today. So let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you so much um, for these moments and these opportunities to gather together. Lord, moments to be in your presence, to hear from your word. Lord, I pray today that you would just speak to us. Lord, I pray that if there is any distractions, Lord, that you would just eliminate those, Lord, that you would help us to be fully present in what you are trying to do and what you are trying to speak to us, Lord. Pray that it would be all of you today and none of me, Lord. We believe for salvation, for restoration, for healing, and Lord, ultimately that you would be glorified. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 
Well, today I wanna start off with a question and that is this, how many of you have ever had those people in your life or maybe you've been this person at a certain time in your life, um, but where they say one thing, but then their life kind of shows something different. You guys ever been there? Okay, I'm the only one. Okay, two of us. Anybody else? Okay, there's a few. Okay, there's a couple. So um, yeah, it, there, you know, you experience that a lot as you get to know people. Um, but for me, I remember a specific time uh, when that happened. My brother and I, we were just getting into mountain biking, actually. And so this was a couple years ago, and we went over to Tiger Mount, which is over on the west side. And we were over there and we were gonna be riding our mountain bikes and we had no idea what we were doing. And so we're there and we just so happened to run into these like mountain bike instructors that like straight up showed us all of the trails and everything. They rode with us the whole time and we had a blast. Like it was super fun. And so we were like, we need to go back. We need to go a second time. And so this time we took our friend, Pastor Evan with us. And so we roll up to the, to the place. We get there, we go down one of the trails and you know, we're, we were having fun, but it was kind of a gray overcast day. So the trails were kind of muddy and we were really hot hot to like try a bunch of different places. So we were like, okay, we, we tried it, let's get out of here, you know? And so, um, but how it works is you get to the bottom of the trail and there's this road that connects you to a ton of other trails. And one of those is the one that actually takes you back to your, your vehicles. And so we were like, okay, what's the fastest way we can get back? Because we wanted to go to some other spots before it got dark. And so we get down there we see this guy at the, bi- at the base of the hill and we're like, okay, this guy knows what he's doing for sure. Like he has the nicest mountain bike ever. He's got the nice helmet, fully fitted, mud all over him. We're like, oh, he definitely knows what he's doing. So we roll up to him. We're like, hey man, do you have any idea of how to like get back to our cars quick? Cause we're trying to go to our next spot. And he's like, yeah, man, I think if you just follow this road, it takes you back to the cars. And we're like, oh, sweet. He's like, yeah, actually, I need to get out of here too. My suspension isn't working right. So we're like, okay, cool. And he's like, yeah, if you just want to follow me, we can, we can go together. And we're like, sweet. So we follow this guy. We go down this hill for like a mile and a half or so just to find out that we get down to the base of this road and it's literally like, on the highway. We're just like on the side of the road in the middle of nowhere, nowhere near where our cars were. And so we just look at this guy, we're like, dude, what? Like, I thought you knew where we were going. And he's like, oh yeah, man, my bad. This is only like my second time here. And we're like, what? And so here we had followed this guy all the way down this trail and down this road, just to find out he had no idea what he was doing. All that to say, we end up getting back to our vehicles, um, but we tacked on like another hour of travel time because everything from where we were was all uphill to get back to our cars. So it was a pain, it was terrible, but I learned in that moment, just don't trust somebody even if they got the cool bike, you know? And so it was one of those things though. He looked like he knew what he was doing, but clearly he had no idea. And and the reason I bring this up is because when it comes to our lives and specifically when it comes to our faith and our Christian walk, we need to be sure that we know who we are following. We need to be sure that we are not following the wrong people that are going to take us down roads and paths that we were never meant to go down. We need to be sure that we are not listening to to false doctrine and wrong ideas and different things that this culture tries to push uh, our way to try to pull us from our relationship and our walk with Jesus. And so with that today, Paul, in the chapters that we're talking about, um, in in 1 Timothy chapter 3, he talks about some qualifications for different leaders and pastors and people within the church. And he really kind of lays down the groundwork for what somebody should, how how they should act within the church. And what we're going to find is is Paul specifically writing to pastors and leaders. um, But really what we're going to find is that if we peel the layers 
years back. This applies to anybody that is seeking to live a righteous lifestyle. And so with that, let's jump into this. uh, First Timothy chapter three. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. This is a lot of reading. So that is a forewarning, but follow along with me. Let's make it fun. Okay, here we go. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he might become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, the women are to be worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be faithful to his wife and must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, and was taken up in glory. Whew, I'm just gonna pat myself on the back. That was good, that was good. But there's a lot that we can take away from this text today. And the first thing is that Paul is writing to Timothy saying, hey, I'm hoping I can be with you soon. I'm hoping that we can be together soon. But in the meantime, here is kind of the ground rules for how the church should function. And now how many of you, if you were to honestly say, have rules in your household? Okay, a few of us, a few of us. And if you're raising your hand, you're like, not really. We just kind of have preferences. You still have rules. Let's just, let's just be honest, okay? You got rules. We all have rules and different ways of living and how we do things. And as I've grown up um, and, and gone to different friends' houses and different people's houses, there are a lot of different rules that you kind of get to see. You know, you get to see how different homes function. And I remember I started to think, I was like, okay, what are some of like weird, rules that I remember growing up. And so one of the ones was we had these next door neighbors, amazing family, um, but they just, they just did things a little bit differently. And so one of the things was uh, uh, my brother and I, we loved uh, airsoft at the time. All of our friends would do it. If you don't know what it is, they're like guns that shoot these little plastic pellets that honestly, if you're pretty close, they hurt pretty bad. Um, and so we would do that all the time. And it's kind of crazy to think about it. Like I look back because we go back to visit our family and stuff. We were like in the front yard shooting across the street at the neighbor's house. Like it was crazy. It was chaos, but it was a blast. And so we had our little neighbor friend. He was significantly younger than my brother and I, but he always wanted to be a part of it. Like he wanted to go every time we went, he wanted to be there. And so we had like a spare gun that we would let him use, but he wanted his own. Like he wanted to have his own. And so uh, he wanted to buy one off of my brother and I. And so the rule that was kind of interesting was his dad was like, in order for you to buy that gun, you have to shoot yourself in the foot with it. But like point blank range. Now, if you don't know anything about airsofting, like, it hurts and, and you're never, like rarely are you ever like point blank shooting anybody or anything, you know, like that's gonna hurt really bad. And so here we are standing there and we're like, yeah, do you want it? You know, and the, and the dad's like, all right, you gotta you got shoot yourself if you want it. And so I don't think the dad really knew what was going on. But anyway, so 
the kid, he, he barefoot, just like his foot's right there, just shoots himself in the foot. He's screaming, crying. It's super awkward. We're just standing there like, ha ha, yeah. You know, and like, you still want the gun? <laughs> you know, and he's like, yes, I do, I do, I do. And so he still took the gun, but man, you know, I guess I understand it a little bit being that like, he knows the pain that it inflicts, you know? Uh, but at the same time, if you kind of applied that same idea to some other things, some limbs might be gone or something like that, you know? So anyway, but that was one of them. I had other friends where it's like, you can't sit on the couches, they're new couches. And then you go over to other houses and then they'd be like, you know, we were growing boys and they had every snack you could ever want and imagine. And we'd like walk into their pantry and we're like, yes dude. And then the, the rule though at the house was you couldn't open anything unless it was already open. So there'd be like one stale bag of chips. Meanwhile, there's this whole pantry full of snacks. So there was just a lot of weird rules. Like, and you, you get to experience that as you grow up. And I'm sure now, you know, with your own homes, you have your own set of rules at your house. And so right here, Paul is writing and he's like, hey, here are the rules. These are the standards of how the church should function and how pastors and leaders need to be functioning within the church. And so he talks about three different types of leaders. He references the first one as an overseer. Um, and that's not really a term that we use today, but what he's referencing is a pastor, somebody who oversees the people and the congregation and the church. And then after that, he talks about deacons. Uh, if you don't know what a deacon is, that is somebody that was serving in the church. And then he also references women. Now, there's some different speculations as far as the women. Uh, some believe that it was referencing uh, women deacons, those that were serving in the church in that capacity. Others believe that it was referencing deacons' wives. But regardless, the truths are still the same no matter who it is for. And, and that's why we're gonna find um, that, that Paul is really giving us a list of guidelines and standards that we can all look to uh, to really seek to live righteous lives. And so with that, we're gonna just quickly kind of go through the list of things and, and talk about how they apply to our lives. So the first one is this, um, we need to live above reproach. Um, what that really means is we need to be above accusation, above question. Like we don't want people to look at us and be wondering, oh, what's going on there? You know, you wanna be sure that you are living Christ-like no matter the circumstance. And if in, somebody is seeing you and looking at you that you are really living with that Christ-like character wherever you are in your life. The next, I think this one's pretty self-explanatory, but uh, it said to be faithful to his wife. Now for us, that's faithful to our spouse, whoever that is, um, because at the time there was polygamy still going on. So there was, you know, multiple wives with one man. And so Paul right here is saying, hey, one man, one wife, and you are called to be faithful to one another. The next thing is to be temperate. This word temperate means to be well balanced. And so ideally a pastor or anybody in ministry needs to be clear headed, moderate and not living in the extremes. Uh, the next one is self-controlled. Uh, we need to be people that are self-controlled in any and all circumstances. And I just had to practice this the other day. I'm gonna really quickly tell this story. Uh, I get the privilege of doing ministry with my brother and one of my best friends, Ethan. Ethan wanted to be sure that I said his name to you guys. So now you know. Anyway, so we were at youth ministry and they were messing around with me. That's just kind of what guys do. Uh, we all like just joke around and tease each other. That's kind of how our friend group is. And so I was going to the bathroom and they're just having a grand old time just messing with me while I'm going to the bathroom. They're like shaking me, like doing all this stuff. And I'm just throwing back a bunch of empty threats. I'm like, dude, you do that again, I'm gonna knock you out. You know, and there's not really much I can do. And so next thing I know, they get really smart with it and he pushes me and my head just goes like into the wall, makes the loudest echoing noise. And my brother and our friend Ethan are just like, 
rolling, like on the ground, just laughing their heads off hysterically because they know I can't do anything. Like my hands are tied. And so the moment I finished, I wanted nothing more than to just like knock them out, you know? But I held it in, I restrained, and then later that night, I beat them up. No, I'm just kidding, no. Uh, <laughs> so no, but I practiced, you know, <laughs> I practiced that self-control in that moment. But the reason I bring that up is because we are gonna find ourselves in those moments that are gonna test us. They're gonna try us. We're not always gonna be in situations where we are completely in control. And so it's important for us to be able to hold on to that self-control in those moments. The next thing is to be respectable. Uh, respectable. Uh, to be polite and courteous, living an honorable life. Um, the next is to be hospitable, to be warm, friendly, considerate, and kind. Um, and, and then to be able to teach. I think this is so important for specifically with pastors, but for all of us that we know God's word, we're able to share it and, and we're able to refute people when they misuse it, but also that we are able to learn God's word, that we are able to be taught. Um, and then the, the next couple things, uh, talks about how they need to be able to manage their own family well, to not give in to drunkenness, to not be violent, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. And so this is really a, a, an extensive good list that we can always refer back to and look at and understand how this can really push us towards a righteous lifestyle. But the question that I really wanna ask today is who are your leaders? Who are your leaders? And obviously we are so blessed to have amazing pastors, Pastor Jeff and Carrie here, who do an amazing job. But even beyond that, because of the world that we live in today, there are so many voices, so many people, so many platforms and opportunities for people to speak into your life. Um, with social media and all of these different things, we have so many influencers and people that we listen to day in and day out, podcasts, YouTube, videos, TV shows, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on uh, of the different content and things that we are continuously taking in. And so we need to be sure that we are listening to people that are resembling Christ in their lives. We need to examine the fruit of people's lives before we just blindly follow and listen to people. The same way my brother and I thought that guy on the mountain bike had it all together. We're like, we're gonna follow him till we die, you know? And he had no idea what he was doing, you know? And so, but the same is true. Sometimes just because people look like they have it together, we need to go deeper than that and really examine. Not everything is surface level. There's a lot more to what things than what meets the eye. And so we need to take that step to really look at who our leaders are. And we don't wanna be taken down a path or a road that we were never intended to go down especially when it comes to our faith. But the next uh, thing that I wanna ask, and this is to really take it a step further, is this, how are you leading? Um, the reality is, is we are all called to ministry. We all, the moment we've come into relationship with Jesus, we have been given a call to share that truth and to share that love and that gift with the people around us. And so we all are called to ministry. We might not be pastors or leaders or, or, or something like that, but we all have that call to share the truths of Jesus with the people around us. God has specifically placed us where he has us to share his word and to spread his love to the people that he's placed into our lives. And so we all have that call on our lives. And so we need to be sure that we are leading well are we leading well in our families, in our workplaces, um, with our friends, at our church, in, in private settings, as well as in public settings, with everybody that we come in contact with, are we resembling Jesus in those moments? You might be the only person in somebody's life that is Christian, the only opportunity for them to know Jesus. You are the reflection of Christ to the people around you. And so we need to be intentional with our lives, both in who we follow as well as who we are leading and how we are leading. And so this is a huge part of us carrying out the work that God calls each and every one of us to 
But with that, we're gonna jump to 1 Timothy chapter four. Again, we got a big chunk of scripture. So just uh, follow along with me. Let's read this together. The spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God in prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teachings that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the savior of all people and especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. So what is Paul really saying here? Paul is, is talking to Timothy and saying, hey, as we get closer to Christ's return, as we get closer to the end, more and more people are going to fall from faith. More and more people are going to slip away from truth. More and more people are gonna be susceptible to these false teachers and these lies that culture tries to push. And I believe that we are seeing that today. We see that so prevalent in our world today. We see many people abandoning their faith. And so this is a warning to all Christians to stand firm, to not be deceived by what is going on in culture, to know our Bibles, to know God's word, so that when something contrary comes up against it, we know the truth. We know where, where we stand. We know where we, what we're fighting for and what we are living for. We need to be sure that we have that solid foundation so that when something comes our way, we're not just gonna be plucked up out of the ground. There is a lot going on in our world today. We need to watch out for false teachers that are gonna try to pull us from our faith. And so how do we equip ourselves to do that? How, how do we stand firm in our faith? And like I said, we need to know God's word, but we also need to train ourselves in righteousness. Train ourselves. And I think that this is where there's a bit of a disconnect. Sometimes we think, you know, yes, we've entered into a relationship with Jesus and we've been given the greatest gift that we could ever receive in salvation and his grace. But that calls us further. It calls us to step towards Christ, to want to know him more. And as you know him more, you begin to live more and more like him and you grow in your righteousness. We are called to stand for that. We're called to live our faith out. And you see righteousness in this world, it shines bright when we are living holy and reverent lives for who Jesus is. You see, even if we look at Jesus himself, he fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights before he began his earthly ministry because he wanted to draw closer to God. He was committing his life to him and this was before he was gonna begin his ministry. And so he is there just committing himself to the Lord. And as he's doing it, what happens? The devil comes. He shows up and he starts to try to tempt him and to try to get in and to have him bow down to him. And you see the enemy wants to do the same thing in our lives. He wants to come in and try to pull us from being in the fullness of who God's called us to be. 
because he knows that when we press in and when we begin to grow in our righteousness and understanding of who God is, not only do we experience the blessings that God has in store for us, but also all of the people around us are reached as well. And so what happens? The devil tries to come in and how did God refute the enemy in that moment? By using scripture. By using God's word, he knew the word and was able to fight off the attack of the enemy. And so church, we need to know God's word. We need to know that it is our map and our, and our guide in this life. It is living, it's breathing, it's active. And that is what is gonna train us and help equip us to live righteous lifestyles. We need to be sure that we are pursuing God with everything that we have. We're called to resist ourselves. We're called to resist the world and to press into God. So church, how are we setting ourselves apart today? How are we growing in righteousness? We wanna be sure that our faith isn't stagnant. We wanna be sure that we are actively taking steps forward because there's always more when it comes to Jesus. And then I love how Paul closes this out. He says to Timothy, he's like, hey, teach these things. I know, I know you're young. And what we know is that around that time, he was about 30 years old and, and he had been given one of the biggest tasks, you know, to lead this church at this time. And he's like, hey, I know you're young and there's gonna be people that are gonna look down on you because you're young, but stand firm continue to do what you're doing, continue to read God's word, continue to profess this truth and know that if you continue to use your gifts and to serve me, not only will you be saved, but everybody around you as well. And what's encouraging from that is that God can use us no matter where we find ourselves. It doesn't matter how old we are. It doesn't matter how young we are. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past. God has given us uh, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us a hope and a future. He has plans to use you in mighty and amazing ways. And so today is an opportunity for us to press into God and just say, Lord, I want to be used by you. I wanna give you everything so that not only am I going to feel your love and be impacted, but everybody around me as well. When we are really living out our faith, people will be changed. Not just us, but everybody that we come into contact with. And so with that, I just wanna spend some time in response. So I'm just gonna invite everybody to bow their heads and close their eyes. You see, God has plans for our lives. He has so much in store for us and he wants to use us in amazing ways. But all of this begins with a personal relationship with Jesus. If we don't know Jesus, then everything else that I've said today is truthfully meaningless. And so today is an opportunity for you to make the best decision of your life, to enter into relationship with Jesus, to just give your life over to him and begin to experience peace and hope and joy and freedom and deliverance in a dying and broken and hurting world, to have purpose beyond this life. And so maybe you've never entered into relationship with Jesus or maybe you have, but you know you've grown distant from the Lord. Today is also an opportunity for you to get right with him as well, for you to recommit your life and to say, God, I want a fresh start in my relationship with you. And so if that's you today, just as a bold act, an act of surrender, just saying, God, I want that. And I wanna just commit this to you. If that's you today, would you, with nobody looking around, just raise your hand right now. If that's you today, if you'd like to make that decision. I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see that hand, I see those hands, I see those hands. Awesome, you guys can lower your hands. Well, I just wanna pray a prayer over all of us and specifically for those that raise their hands. But if you raise your hand today, what I encourage you to do is just take a moment to pray. If you've never prayed before, all it is is a simple conversation with you and God. And all you have to do is just say, Lord, I ask you into my life. I ask that you would make me new, that you would restore me and cleanse me, that you would help me to turn from my sin. 
Lord, I'm thankful for a new life in you. And then just begin to talk to God. Just cry out to him. Just tell him what you're going through, what you're walking through, how you need him to move and work in your life. And just pray that he would have his will in your life. But I'm just gonna pray a prayer over you that raised your hand. And then I'm just gonna pray over all of us. So let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you so much for the work that you have done here today. Lord, we thank you that you meet us where we are at. Lord, that we don't have to come to you perfect with everything figured out, but God, we know that you are so faithful and that your grace goes deeper than anything that we could ever do. Lord, I just pray for those that raise their hand today, Lord God, that you would just bless them, that you would move within their lives. Make yourself so present and evident uh, to them, Lord. I just pray for all of us, Lord, that you would just encourage us and equip us, help us to live boldly and unashamedly for you, to live truly righteous lives, Lord God, being weary of the people that we are looking to for leadership and for guidance and for direction, Lord God, but that we would just press on towards you, knowing that you have plans for our lives, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would just protect us, Lord, that you would help us to just truly be a light for you in our world and to know, Lord, that not only is this truth for us, but it's for everybody that you've placed into our lives. Lord, I pray that you would just help us to be bold for you. We love you, we thank you, and we just give you the rest of this week. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Well, guys, it's been so good to be here with you today. Uh, if you made that decision to follow Jesus today, we'd love to meet you up here in the front. We have some Bibles and some next steps for you guys, but hope you have an amazing rest of your Sunday and enjoy your week. Have a great day.